morning, everyone. Um, we're continuing to look at the first letter of Peter. We're up to chapter 5. And I'm just going to read the first um, six verses of 1 Peter chapter 5. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Let's just pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is freely available to us. And Lord, as we look into your word together this morning, we just ask that the Holy Spirit would, would open it up to us, would, would guide us in our thinking, and Lord, would just use this word to change us, to make us more and more like you. Amen. I was sitting in my um, office at home the other day, working on the computer, and I heard the post drop through the letterbox. So I thought, oh, I'll go and see what the postman's brought. So I got up and walked out to go and get the post, but as I went past the kitchen, I thought, oh, I'll make myself a cup of coffee. So I went into the kitchen, turned the kettle on, then realised that my favourite coffee mug was in the front room from earlier in the day. So I went into the front room to get it. And as I walked into the front room, I noticed that the clock had stopped and it needed a new battery. And the new batteries are in the drawer in the office. So I went back into the office, <laughs> sat down at my computer and carried on with my work. <laughs> so uh, that is a slightly made up story. Carol will know it's made up because if I saw the, back, the clock had stopped, there's no way straight away. Uh, it would be about six months it had been stopped before I went. <laughs> Change the battery. So I'd started a lot, but I'd achieved nothing. I'd jumped from one thing to another. And you know, Peter's letter, it seems to jump about a bit from one thing to another. But there is a very important difference between Peter's letter and me. And that is I'd achieved nothing, but actually Peter's letter achieves much. It does jump about, or it does seem to us to jump about. But in it there is much effective teaching. Effective teaching for the first century Christians to whom it was originally written and effective teaching for us today. Of course we must remember when we, when we read this letter that these people that, that Peter was writing to were all relatively new Christians. It was a relatively new church. When I was thinking about it I realised that actually I've been a Christian for longer than any of them, including Peter. And I still struggle. And I still get things wrong. So it's important that there was this teaching for them. And as we've seen over the last few weeks, that it was it's how to live as a follower of Jesus. And we've talked about living holy lives. How to live at work, how to live as a Christian at home. How to live as a Christian in times of increasing persecution and today these few verses here touch on how we live together as Christians as part of God's church and there's a theme through it all although it does seem to jump about there is a theme through it all and if you look at it you can see that whether we're talking about living at home whether we talk about living at work whether we talk about living as Christians as part of God's church, it's the same. We, we're not one type of person, or we shouldn't be, one type of person in church, a different type of person at home. 
and the third type of person at work. There is a common theme. And that common theme is submission. Now those of us who can, can think back perhaps to the late 60s and the 70s. Saturday afternoon. Wrestling. That's it, guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Four o'clock. ITV. It was almost a ritual in our house. If we were at home, oh, it wasn't just us. I, I, I thought, was it just us? And we were weird. Big Daddy. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever you were doing, my dad and my brother and I would sit down and watch the wrestling. Mick McManus. Yeah. Big Daddy. Giant haystacks. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and at the, uh, at the start of each wrestling bout, the, the announcer would say, this bout is of ten five-minute rounds to be decided by two falls, two submissions, or a knockout. Or a knockout. <laughs> Fiona looks very confused. <laughs> and the submission was where one of the wrestlers would put the other wrestler in a hole that was supposedly so painful that they couldn't bear it and they tapped out. <coughs> if that is your idea of submission, it's not what God means by submission and it's not what Peter means by submission. It's not that God inflicts pain upon us to force us to submit to his will. It's a choice. And it's a choice that, that Peter clearly presents throughout this, le this letter. We can choose to submit or we can choose not to submit. It's something that we give of our own free will whether it's submission to God, or whether it's submission to one another. And as I say, Peter has this as a theme throughout the, list, the letter, how to live as a Christian, we live in submission to God, and we live in submission to one another. In fact, you could argue that if we're not submitted to, God, to one another, then we're not submitted to God, because his will is that we submit to one another. And so Peter, in these verses at the start of chapter 5, is talking about how to live as Christians in the church. And as I've said, he's addressing new Christians, new, relatively new Christians, relatively new churches. And he addresses the church leaders first. Now you might expect that if he's going to talk about submission, he'll be addressing the congregation first. Or as, or as Peter calls it, he and the flock. But Peter addresses the church leaders first. And of course, they're new churches. There were not hundreds of years of tradition on how to do church, which some of us might think is a good thing. There were not loads of books on how to do church, on church growth, how to run a prayer meeting and so on. It was all new to them. What they were surrounded with was lots of ways and lots of examples of how the world did things. How the world, people in the world treated each other and how the people in the world did leadership. And remember that that time they were part of the Roman Empire. So that was what they saw as a model of leadership. But right back at the beginning of this, of this letter, Peter addresses those to whom he was writing as aliens and strangers in this world. And the same applies to us, or it should do. We are in the world... <coughs> But we're not of the world. We are members, and they are members of God's kingdom. And members of God's kingdom do things differently. 
so easy, isn't it, to get caught up in doing the things of the world. There was um, various psychology experiments that have been done where they, they sit two people down to talk with each other and they film it. And what they find is that very often, as the two people have a conversation, they start to mirror each other in their body language, in their actions, in their expressions, in their hand movements. Subconsciously. And in, you know, in a similar way, we can find ourselves, if we're not careful, mirroring the things of the world. So as members of God's kingdom, we do things differently. And one of those things different that we do differently is we are submitted to one another, as well as submitted to God. So Paul writes to the, to the elders, the leaders of the churches, and says, be submitted, not just to God, not just to one another, but to the people that God has given you to care for. Now we need to be careful here. What does it mean for a church leader to be submitted? Does it mean that before they can make any decisions, they have to go and ask everybody else what they should do? They have to have a vote. They have to have a refer referendum. And if they don't get the answer they want, they have a people's vote. <laughs> no. That's not what it means. Yes, submitted to God, sub, sorry, submitted to one another, but also submitted to God because church leaders have been appointed by God to lead and to discern his will for the people under their care. Let's just have a look at Romans chapter 12, just a couple of verses in here. Romans chapter 12, verse 3, first of all. For, and this is Paul writing, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. And then in verse 10, well, let's read from verse 9. Verse 9 says, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. And then he says this, be devoted to one another <coughs> excuse me, in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourselves. And that to me is what being submitted to one another, whether we're a church leader or whether we're not, that is what submission means. It means honouring others above yourself. And therefore a church leader appointed by God to lead, discerning God's will for his people, prayerfully will arrive at decisions not necessarily for his own personal benefit, but he will make decisions and he will, will seek God on decisions that are to the benefit of those they are leading. Come back to that idea in a moment. But Peter, when he starts this letter, this, this part of his letter, says this to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder. So what is he doing? He's putting himself alongside them. He's not putting himself above them and saying, you know, I'm more important than you, you need to do what I tell you. He's putting along himself alongside them and saying we're in this together. But then, he says this, a witness of Christ's sufferings. Now I don't believe, because he said he's a fellow elder, I don't believe he said, oh, I was with Jesus, and therefore I'm more important than you, and I know more about it than you. No, he's not, he's not doing it in that way, he's saying this is my authority. This is the authority that I can bring to our journey together. I was a witness of Christ's sufferings. I spent time with Jesus. 
And then he says, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. And remember we said at that time that the church was um, undergoing increasing persecution. But Peter is saying here, together, yes, we will go through this. Together, we will be victorious in Jesus. And so Peter, in just in this introduction to this, this part of the letter, he's actually putting into practice what he's saying. He is submitting to them. He's not putting himself above them, but putting himself alongside them. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers. Now to the world, that might be a contradiction. How can you serve as an overseer? When I was at the, uh, at the grammar school, um, I think it was about 2002, I was uh, promoted to be director of studies. And as director of studies, you're responsible for all the heads of the different subjects. And not long after, it was only a, a few, matter of a few months after I'd been appointed, um, we had an inspection. And I thought, great. This is the best time to have an inspection, because if there's anything wrong, it was the fault of the person who had the job before me. And if there's anything right, it's because I've done it since I took over. <coughs> Didn't quite work like that. <laughs> but I remember I had an interview with, with, with one of the inspectors, and uh, he was asking me, what was my role as director of studies? And... Uh, I can't remember exactly what I said, but somewhere in it I said, oh, it was to serve the heads of departments to help them do their job. And he really objected to the word serve. You shouldn't be saying that. You're not to serve them, they're to do as you tell them. Because the ways of the world are not the ways of God. But actually, the best way to get people to do something you want them to do is to come alongside them and work with them. Yeah. Mm. And so that's what Peter's saying here. Don't lord it over the flock. Don't boss them around, as we often see in the world, but have a servant attitude and a servant heart. And you'll get the best out of those people. Just want to show you show you this. That is the world's view of leadership. Yeah? There's the leader at the top, there's everybody else underneath. That's God's view of leadership. Mm -hmm. That's God's way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Notice that that's upside down? Mm -hmm. Yes? But isn't that what it says, that Jesus is coming to turn the world upside down? Mm -hmm. well, why is he coming to turn it upside down? Because it's the wrong way up anyway. <coughs> So as leaders, whether it's leaders within the church, and you know, there's all sorts of leaders within the church. It's not just the overseers, it's not just the deacons. It might be that you're leading a prayer group, you might be leading a Bible study, you might be leading people in providing the tea and coffee. <coughs> Whatever position we find ourselves in, then as leaders, whatever type of leader, we should have a servant heart. Peter goes on to give three reasons why people in the world might be in positions of leadership. And if we look around, I think we will recognise these, and I'm sure that those first century Christians in the Ro of part of the Roman Empire would recognise these as well. Three reasons why people in the world might be in positions of leadership. One is they have to be. Second, they're in it for the money, and third, they're in it for the power. And sometimes it's power and money, isn't it? So he says, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, not because somebody's appointed you to it and you don't really want to do it, 
but because you are willing. And why should you be willing? Because it is as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Now, I'm not saying that church leaders shouldn't be paid, but that shouldn't be, money should not be the motivation. So much today in the world, the motivation is money, isn't it? Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Motivated not by money, not by greed, but by love for those that God has entrusted to you. And they're not for power. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock, just as Peter, in the way he introduces this part of the letter, was being an example to the others. And then he goes on to say, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. And there is our perfect example. The chief shepherd, Jesus. Jesus, involved in the creation of the world, along with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. If anybody has the right to lord it over anyone, it is Jesus. But in Philippians 2, it says this. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Submission. A servant attitude. A servant heart. And then in John chapter 13... I'll just start reading this at, at verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, it wasn't unusual for, for you if you walked to a meal in those days to have your feet washed when you got there. But you might imagine that that job was reserved for the lowest servant. And Jesus washed his disciples' feet. He took the place of the lowest servant. Now I could say very much a lot, a lot about this, I won't this morning, but it says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. And because Jesus knew who he was in God, he could take the role of the lowest servant. And then, and I found this interesting when I was looking at it, he came to Simon Peter. Peter, the person who's writing this letter, came to Simon Peter, he said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realise now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Peter, then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And we see there the impulsiveness that we've so often seen in Peter as we, were, as we looked at him. See how much Peter has changed since that day? And now he understands. Now he understands about submission. Now he understands about having a servant heart and a servant attitude. 
So back in the, our verses in 1 Peter 5, it says, When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. And it just seems to me this is the second time that he said something like this in, within a few verses, isn't it? Where he's talked about the future glory. And I can just see that Peter, he's, he knows he's coming to the end of his life. He knows there's a time of persecution. He knows what Jesus prophesied over him about his death, that he would be crucified. And he's not looking at the persecution. He's not looking at his own suffering or the suffering that is to come. He is seeing beyond that to the glory that is to be revealed. And then it says, verse 5, Peter writes, Young men in the same way be submissive to those who are older. In some version it says those who are younger, so it's not just young men. Those who are younger. And it doesn't, I don't think it necessarily means those who are younger in age. I believe it means those who are younger in the faith. And just as he's told the elders to be examples to the flock, he's telling the flock to follow their example. To learn how to live as Christians in the world, in the kingdom of the world, whereas we belong to the kingdom of God. And it's, it's there, isn't it, all the way through. It is in submission to God and in submission to one another and putting others first. You know, I received a, a text message in the week. Um, it just, I can't remember the exact words. It just some, said something, I've been praying for you this morning. <coughs> Not really touched me. Because somebody had thought to pray for me. But not just they thought to pray for me, they thought to tell me they were being praying for me. <laughs> because they were putting me ahead of themselves. I have this, I have this theory, you can tell me it, it's nonsense if you like, but actually if we all lived as we're supposed to live, as part of God's church, we wouldn't need to pray for ourselves because everybody else would be praying for us and we could just concentrate on praying for everybody else. <laughs> And he says, all of you, so he's not just talking to the young ones now, he's talking to everybody, every Christian, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Um, on Wednesday, Carol and I went to uh, a hospital at King's Lynn, it was to an education group, which is basically that, if I ever get my hip operation, um, how to look after it for the first few weeks afterwards so you don't dislocate it and so on. And uh, it was taken by a physiotherapist and they can be a bit strict, can't they? Physio physiotherapists. And the one thing she said was, you've had an operation, you're not ill, don't stay in your pyjamas all day. <laughs> I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so they tell you, oh, it's really difficult getting dressed at first when you, you know, you've had your hip operation. But, Get dressed, don't stay in your pyjamas all day. So you have to make a conscious decision to get dressed. And so it is here when he says, clothe yourselves with humility. We have to make a conscious decision to put on humility. And then he said, but God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand. Just one last little story and a last little um, scripture reference. A number of years ago, Carol and I were invited to go to a dinner at my old college in Cambridge because the, the chap who had been my chemistry professor when I was there, they would become the master of the college, and, and he was retiring. So we went off to this rather posh dinner. Um, with a lot of people there, and we're probably over 100 at this dinner and we were waiting to go into the hall for the meal and there was a seating plan and I looked at this seating plan and there was various tables set out and there was this long table at the bottom and our names were on that and I said to Carol, well, look, we sat at the back which is what I expected to be and uh, when we got in I realised I'd been looking at the seating plan upside down and actually we were sat at the top table <laughs> with the master of the college and, and I have no idea why <laughs> but it was very nice <laughs> but it, uh, 
it reminded me of something that Jesus said. Um, and again, it's, it's a contrast with how the world does things, isn't it? Um, this is in Luke 14. Um, and it, it, uh, Jesus had gone to eat at the, at the house of a prominent Pharisee. And there were quite a few people there who had been, uh, who'd been invited. And it says this. When Jesus noticed how the guests picked the places of honour at the table, he told them this parable. While someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honour, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host will invite both of, who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited... Take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honoured in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so there's the contrast with the world, isn't it? The world looks for the important places. Mm. God says, take the lowest place. Take the lowest place. But God will use you there. Not only will God use you there, he also will lift you up. So we are to act humbly towards one another. We are to be submitted to God, submitted to one another, honouring one another. Whether we're church leaders or whether we're part of the flock, whether we're in church, whether we're at home, whether we're out of work, we live as members of God's kingdom and not as the kingdom of the world, showing the same attitude that we see in Christ Jesus, the chief shepherd. Amen.